Welcome to the second My Germanized Life Variety Show, where we explore German grammar, vocabulary, culture, and more. Today, we're going to talk about Christmas, or Weihnachten in Germany. Then, I'll give you an overview of the German cases and how they work. We'll explore important German vocabulary that you'll need at the computer. Then, I'm going to tell you a short German story called Weihnachten in Tannenstadt. To finish off, we'll play a game of Guess That Bundesland, where you can play along and learn fun facts about the German states. You won't want to miss a minute, so get your glue vine and let's get going. Willkommen, liebe Zuschauer! In today's first segment, we're diving into German Christmas traditions, where festive delights and centuries-old customs come together, and it's going to create a truly enchanting holiday season. German Christmas markets, or Weihnachtsmärkte, typically kick off around late November, and last until just a couple days before Christmas. You can find these markets in cities all over Germany. When you get there, you'll see hundreds of elaborately decorated booths for vendors. Atop the stalls are spectacular Christmas displays adorned with lights and detailed Christmas scenes. Intricate scenes feature detailed traditional villages and cottages, Santa and his reindeer, shiny packages, and rich greenery. Each Weihnachtsmarkt is slightly different depending on the region and city. Some have ice skating rinks, while others have roller coasters and carnival rides. And of course, every region has its own unique delicacies. Delicious, if I might add. You can buy handcrafted ornaments, soaps, incense, or just enjoy the unique beauty of each decorated rooftop. If you get the munchies, head on over to one of those many fit food vendors. You can find sweets like Lebkuchen, gingerbread, gebrannte Mandeln, candied almonds, and Schmolzkuchen, which are like donut holes. And don't worry about those cold German winters. There's a special solution for those. A mug of hot glue vine. That's going to keep you toasty warm. This hot spiced wine is a favorite beverage of the Zucha, the Weihnachtsmarkt. At the center of every German Christmas market is a larger-than-life Christmas tree with lights towering all the way up to the top. And these trees are often delivered to the city centers, especially for this occasion. They can be taller than a five-story building. Let's talk about another favorite German Christmas tradition, Advent. In Germany, Advent is celebrated by counting down the Sundays before Christmas. It's a religious celebration and preparation for the arrival, or Advent, of the Christ Child, das Christkind. The first week of Advent is the fourth Sunday before Christmas, and an Adventskranz is a typical decoration associated with this occasion. These pine wreaths are a tradition that dates back to 1839. You can buy a ready-made one, or you can make it yourself. You'll need four candles, an arrangement of winter greenery, usually in a wreath shape, and some ornaments or decorations. On the first advent, you light the first candle. And on the second advent, you light two candles, and so on, until all four candles are lit. An advent's calendar is another tradition, but this one's mostly for children. You have a calendar with 24 sachets, or doors, and behind each door is a piece of candy or a treat. And you get to open one door every day until Christmas Eve. This year, Advent begins Sunday, December 3rd, and in 2024, Advent starts Sunday, December 1st. So get your Advent's ready and your Advent's calendar. It's almost time. Next, let's talk about Sankt Nikolaus Tag, or St. Nicholas Day. December 5th is a special night for children in Germany as well. They place their boots outside of the door, and St. Nicholas needs a special treat. The kids wake up and find a bunch of sweets or toys in their boots, 
but if you're on the naughty list, you might just get a lump of coal instead. Let's not forget about Plätzchenbacken. Weihnachten is also the time of year to bake Christmas cookies, or Plätzchen in German. In addition to Lebkuchen, Germans often bake a variety of other cookies, like Zimtsterne, cinnamon stars, vanilla Kipfelle, vanilla half moon, and jam-filled Kaiserplätzchen. And that's how you celebrate Christmas in Germany. Let's move on to that grammar section. Introduction to the German cases. German has four cases that include the nominative, accusative, dative, and genitive. But what do they mean and how should you know which one to use when? This is going to be a beginner's guide that introduces you to German cases and it's going to help you understand the concept behind this unusual grammar topic. This will be especially helpful if you have no idea what the German cases are and haven't touched the topic yet. As English speakers, the idea of German cases might sound confusing and even frightening, but German cases are easier to handle than you might think. The first step is to understand how grammar works in your language. Let's talk about the English cases versus the German cases. Before diving into this case system details, it's essential to learn the names of each part of a sentence. We have our friend, the subject, gave, the verb, us, the indirect object, a key, direct object, to his brother's house, a prepositional phrase, to being the preposition. And in German, we have unser Freund, gab uns einen Schlüssel zum Haus seines Brüders. In English, you probably don't think a lot about the labels of each word in your sentences. So a reminder can be helpful when you're learning German grammar. Next, let's see how each element of the sentence corresponds to a German case. We have the German case equivalent and the sentence element. Our subject is nominative, our friend, unser Freund. The direct object is accusative, a key, einen Schlüssel, and the indirect object is dated, uns, us. And our possessive object is genitive, his brothers, seines Bruders. Usually in English, you use word order to indicate who is doing what in a sentence. But German, on the other hand, uses cases. It allows you to place the nouns in different positions throughout the sentence without changing the meaning. In English, she and her mean the same thing, but you use them in different situations, depending on what sounds right. The same concept applies in German, but until you know what sounds right, you have to use the grammar rules to help you. In this table, you can see how the sentence subject takes the nominative case. Likewise, direct objects take the accusative case, and indirect objects take the dative case. Finally, possessive objects take the genitive case. These cases apply to nouns themselves, their endings and modifiers, and adjectives and determiners. These are just fancy words for things like the, a, and an. Now let's look at each case in a little more detail, what it is and how to identify it. Let's start with the nominative case. Sentence subjects take the nominative case in German. You can identify the sentence subject by asking who, wer, or what, was, is performing the verb. Let's look at some examples first of the nominative case and subjects in a sentence. Our first example is, wir sind da, we are there. Kennst du ihn? Do you know him? Das Haus ist gelb. The house is yellow. Eine Katze kommt. Eine Katze kommt. A cat is coming. Sein Buch fehlt. His book is missing. Usually, sentence subjects come at the beginning 
in English. Or after helping words like a, the, his, her, do, or other similar words. And in German, these helping words and sometimes the nouns have different forms depending on the case. Now let's have a look at the accusative case. You want to use the accusative case for direct objects in a sentence. Typically, direct objects are things the subject is acting upon and answers the question who or whom. In German, you use wen in place of who in the accusative case. Our first example, ich mag dich, I like you. Ich is the subject, mag, the verb, and dich are direct objects in accusative. Next, er hat einen Stein. He has a stone. Einen Stein is accusative. Sie nimmt das Brot. She takes the bread. Sie, subject, das Brot, accusative, direct object. Wen hast du getroffen? Who did you meet? Wir haben ihn getroffen. We met him. Him being accusative, direct object. Now, if we look at the dative case, what's different about dative is that it identifies the indirect object. So this is the person or thing receiving an action from the subject via the direct object. Usually, you have to have a direct object to have an indirect object because the indirect object cannot stand alone in the sentence. For example, two, er malt ihnen ein Bild. He paints them a picture. Sie haben uns Besteck geschenkt. They gifted us silverware. Du leist mir das Auto. You loan me the car. Wir geben ihm die Anweisungen. We give him the instructions. Here in every example, you can see the thing you're giving is accusative and the person receiving the thing is in dative. Last but not least, let me tell you about the genitive case. In German and English, the genitive, genitiv, or possessive case, it lets us indicate belonging. You'll usually find the genitive case more frequently in written German than in spoken German. In spoken German, the case is often replaced with a dative equivalent. In its question form, the genitive case asks the question whose or wessen. Let's look at a few examples of this. Wessen Auto ist das? Whose car is that? Die Küche Unsere Mutter ist groß. Our mother's kitchen is large. Das Wohnzimmer deines Bruders ist klein. Your brother's living room is small. Der Urlaub seines Onkels ist im Juli. His uncle's vacation is in July. Der Geburtstag meiner Schwester is dem Februar. My sister's birthday is in February. These are the four cases that you'll need to learn. Remember, this is just an overview of how the cases work. For the full lesson on German cases, I'll leave a link down below for you in the description, and you can work at it at your own pace. The full lesson includes a list of pronouns, preposition, and points out when to use each case. So it can help you take the next step in your understanding of German. Let's get started learning some useful vocabulary for German computers and technology. Künstliche Intelligenz. That's artificial intelligence. Big data is the same. Big data. Data management. Die Datenverarbeitung. Deep learning is tiefes Lernen. The digitalization, future proof, zukunftssicher, machine learning, das maschinelles Lernen, self-driving vehicles, 
fahrerlose Transportsysteme, FTS. Now let's look at some important German words for using the computer. The cursor, it's called der Mauszeiger. The keyboard, die Tastatur, the operating system, das Betriebssystem. The user, der Benutzer, the user account, das Benutzerkonto, the password, das Passwort, das Kennwort, the Start Menu, das Startmenü, Quick Access, der Schnellzugriff, Settings, die Einstellungen, Select, Auswählen, the File, die Datei, die Dateien, Plural. Folder, der Ordner. My computer, der Arbeitsplatz. My documents, eigene Dateien. My music, eigene Musik. My pictures, eigene Bilder. Add, hinzufügen, edit, ändern, cancel, abbrechen. And for a full list of German digital vocabulary, I'll leave a link down in the description so you can read the entire blog post. Let's move on to that next segment. It's short story time. Weihnachten in Tannenstadt. In der charmanten deutschen Stadt Tannenstadt gab es einen besonderen Weihnachtsmarkt. Wenn die Sonne unterging, tauchte er in einen magischen Glanz. Wenn der Mond hoch am Himmel stand, erwachten die Figuren auf den Dächern zum Leben. Die holzernen Engel, Nussknacker und Schneemänner wurden lebendig. Die kleinen Figuren, Beschützer der festlichen Zeit, hatten eine geheime Tradition. Während die Dorfbewohner schliefen, wurde der Markt zu einem Treffpunkt. Heute Abend ging es um den Nordpol. Anja, der Engel auf dem Süßigkeiten stand, flatterte mit den Flügeln und begann das Gespräch. Habt ihr die neuesten Nachrichten vom Nordpol gehört, Freunde? Der stoische Herr Nussknacker richtete seinen Schnurrbart und antwortete, Ja, Anja, es heißt, dass die Werkstatt des Weihnachtsmanns sehr beschäftigt ist. Die Elfen arbeiten rund um die Uhr, um Wünsche zu erfüllen. Helga, die Schneefrau, mit freundlichem Grinsen sagte, Und sie haben am Nordpol ein neues Kakaorezept. Die Rentiere mögen es genauso wie die Elfen. Die Figuren plauderten lebhaft über das geschäftige Treiben am Nordpol. Sie teilten Geschichten von funkelnden Lichtern und lustigen Schneeballschlachten unter den Elfen. Als die Nacht fortschritt, setzten die Figuren ihre Klatscherei fort. Sie warfen sich aufgeregte Blicke zu als ein Miniaturschlitten mit winzigen Rentieren herabkam. Santa stieg aus, der legendäre Weihnachtsmann. Höchstpersönlich. Der Weihnachtsmann lachte warm. Guten Abend, meine Freunde. Ich dachte, ich bringe euch eine Prise Nordpol-Magie nach Tannenstadt. Mit einer Handbewegung zauberte der Weihnachtsmann Nordlichter, die über den Himmel tanzten. Die Figuren jubelten und der Weihnachtsmann sagte, die Magie von Weihnachten ist überall, im Lachen der Freunde und in den Geschichten, die uns verbinden. Das Ende. I hope you enjoy this German Christmas story. Let's move on to that final segment, a game I know you're going to love to play. 
It's time to play a game I call Name That Bundesland. In this game, I'll ask a question and you'll try to guess the correct answer at home. So let's get started. Our first question is, which German state is known for its stunning black forest, cuckoo clocks, and the birthplace of the Grimm's Brothers fairy tales? Is it A, Bavaria? Is it B, Baden-Württemberg? Is it C, Hesse? Or is it D? The answer is B, Baden-Württemberg. Let's look at our next question. Question two. In which state would you find the historic city of Dresden, known for its beautifully reconstructed Kirche and the Semper Oper? Is it A, Saxony? Is it B, Rheinland? Is it C, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern? Or D, Brandenburg? The answer is A, Saxony. Question three. Which German state is famous for its picturesque coastline along the North Sea and the Baden Sea National Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Is it A, Lower Saxony? Is it B, Liesbeck Holstein? Is it C, Saarland? Or D, Hamburg? The answer is B, Liesbeck Holstein. Our fourth question, in which state is the financial hub of Frankfurt located, known for its impressive skyline and the European Central Bank? Is it A, Nordrhein-Westfalen? Is it B, Rheinland-Pfalz? Is it C, Bremen? Or D, Hesse? The answer is D, Hesse. Question five, which state boasts the world-renowned Oktoberfest celebration in its capital city, Munich? It's also known for its breathtaking alpine landscapes. Is it A, Baden-Württemberg? Is it B, Berlin? Is it C, Bavaria? Bayern? Or is it D, Schleswig-Holstein? The answer is C, Bavaria, or Bayern in German. How many answers did you get right? Let me know in the comments below. And that's all for this show. Bis bald, German learners. Auf Wiedersehen.